you all this evening. Uh, a great Omaha spring evening. <laughs> we, of course, weren't going to do this in the middle of the winter, so that was a good move. Yeah. Now that it's warm and pleasant out there. <laughs> and I uh, want to thank everyone who wrestled the weather, wrestled the parking, etc. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll make your evening extremely worthwhile. I was calculating there are probably several thousands of hours going into uh, the development of the seminar. <clears throat> and uh, so we'll begin at the very, very beginning here. And uh, let me introduce, just by name briefly, and I'll introduce more so in a moment, on my left, uh, three of our panelists and uh, contributors shortly. Uh, on my very, very, very left, and on uh, your very left, actually. We'll start with uh, Laverne uh, Train, who will give us expert testimony related to uh, Fort Calhoun. And we have Fran Akita, who uh, has been had been living in Japan, who provides some, I think, very, very important information. And uh, Dr. Arong Chen. Dr. Arong is the uh, director of the Asian World Center at the Craig University. And so that will be also some very important ramifications that he'll address. And let me thank the Alms Center. Sandy always does a fantastic tenure, and uh, my, in my opinion, one of the best that is in all of Omaha. Uh, in traditional fashion, let me tell you what it is that we're going to say, and then we'll say it, and then at the end we'll tell you what it is we said. Uh, first, I want to give you a very terse, tight, presentation of the hard data surrounding the situation at the uh, Fukushima Daiichi plant, the nuclear plant that was struck by a tsunami March 11th in 2011, 2011 uh, trying to give you a very concise, clear idea of what that status is today. Second, we'll look at the health ramifications of that because uh, this indeed is being hosted uh, jointly besides the Arm Center by the Therapeutics Research Institute. And <clears throat> as a senior research scientist for that institute, the key is that there are critical health implications, one, for people in Omaha immediately, actually worldwide, but more importantly, to bring you here, drag you here at night, is to tell you the things we have uncovered that you'll be able to do for yourself that will essentially prevent most of the dangers we'll be elaborating on tonight, and in some critical cases, should even describe for those who are confronted with that, actually how to even reverse radiation damage. There's some remarkable reports that have been uncovered and documented, and some of that information, to my knowledge, and I've spent 37 years scouring the net and doing research, I don't believe is available anywhere else yet in the world. So that's kind of exciting. We want to bring that to your attention. <clears throat> Before we give that portion, we have Fort Calhoun nuclear plant in our own backyard. And we'll be asking Laverne to give you a status of where that stands. Unfortunately, to what extent it may be our own mini Fukushima. <clears throat> and then, as a result, we'll have a panel discussion very briefly. Uh, including Dr. Wong's contributions about the political and economic ramifications, and then we'll want to have questions and answers for the group as a whole. And I invite you to continue that with uh, refreshments as well as some further uh, commentaries and conversation one on one, depending on just uh, whatever your interests might be. <clears throat> uh, the Therapeutics Research Institute. Uh, itself, just as some of you may know, but just to repeat, uh, is a, a nonprofit, a research institute, uh, 501c3, that is to say, it's a tax exempt, it sells no products, and uh, there'll be no products that you know we're selling. Everything we want to identify are things that you can get on your own on the web, identifying tonight very specifically, absolutely in great detail, what it is that we believe are your best choices. <clears throat> and uh, for those people who have said, you know, I mean, there are people who uh, go to Jiffy Lube and some people go to Walmart and buy your own oil and change your own oil. And so for those people who have said, well, I'm not going to go to the web, etc., just do it, uh, 
we assembled just some of the kits for those people. Uh, and we just went to the web and bought it. There's nothing special except I just put them together, which I'll show you for those people who just prefer get it done and just you know let us get it and so forth. And but either way, the key is to arm you with the critical information. So that's sort of the big picture tonight. And let me begin by recalling to mind the most critical beginning of this story on March 11th in 2011. An earthquake and tsunami rocked Japan, fatally, fatally crippling their electric company, their OPPD, I call TEPCO, uh, uh, running a number of nuclear power plants. So the current situation is that they then evacuated a 12-mile zone of exclusion around that uh, in which probably life would not really uh, thrive or possibly even exist over a period of time. And, and indeed, right now, no one is actually allowed to live in that area uh, from the government's official position, although there are a few people actually who went back that they are actually not allowed to be there. And what happened with the nuclear plants, um, and uh, particularly uh, the uh, uh, number four plant, and there is this plant, uh, here are the walls holding it up, the top of the plant blew entirely off through the subsequent explosion. So when you look at it, it just looks like a spaghetti factory, you know? It's just uh, helter-skelter stuff all about. And 30 meters above the ground, is a pool of water, an Olympic-sized swimming pool of water, filled with these rods that are up there, 100 feet up, that slowly rise when they were utilized, and they're now extremely radioactive. Without the water, they would blow up like an atomic bomb. They just moved into that pool. And that pool is 100 feet up. The walls of that pool are now at about a 60-degree angle, and the Walls themselves are sinking into the ground. They're about 31 inches down into the dirt. The intensity of the ongoing radiation is so great that it degrades dirt. And I think that's just, I find that utterly amazing. You know, just it's so mind-bogglingly intense. Uh, and of course, it's somewhat totally uneven in terms of what's happening. And there are 1,553 uh, cores, radioactive cores, in a pool that is slowly leaking 100 feet up in an area for which the top is blown off and the walls are caving in. If that pool were to crack or lose that water, you basically have the equivalent of exploding the 1,553 little atomic bombs all at once in that area. And this is not good. Uh, the other nuclear power plants, Tepco was saying, initially not to worry, but now they have identified that this is the first time uh, there's a complete and total meltdown of the entire nuclear plant and at least three of the reactors. And the inner core of steel is completely melted. The concrete is completely melted. You know, it's kind of hard to imagine that sort of thing. A nuclear fire will, in fact, burn concrete. It's, you know, we just we have to sort of think of the surface of the sun rather than the common use of the word fire. And, and there is, when you see it on robotic imagery, that can only take it at a distance because the robots and machinery literally disintegrate if they get too close at this point in time. It just looks like a gigantic slush of jello uh, floating about. And within uh, 165 feet of that plant are other plants that's pretty close, containing another 6,375 fuel rods, and then there is another plant nearby, so there are a total of 11,421 rods in these tenuous pools of water uh, for which, uh, you know, we have the potential for, the, for that to ignite would create, of course, the largest atomic uh, nuclear catastrophe in the history of the world. <clears throat> Let me quote Dr. Robert Alvarez, who is the former senior policy advisor and deputy assistant secretary for national security and the environment at the U.S. Department of Energy. He said, now if another earthquake or, or similar event caused the pool to drain, 
This could result in a catastrophic radiologic fire involving nearly 10 times the amount of cesium that was released in the Chernobyl accident uh, back in the Ukraine, the Chernobyl nuclear meltdown created the world's largest disaster and sent cesium clouds around the entire world. Uh, the U.S. National o Ocean and Atmospheric Administration's Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory poured tracer dye off of Fukushima just to see where that contamination would go, and they published the results uh, in the environmental research letters. And they showed that the North American continent, the West Coast, would end up with 10 times more radioactive cesium than actually the coastal waters off of Japan itself. And that's because as the currents keep moving that, that would just bring it all the way to the West Coast. And, uh, the former Japanese ambassador to Switzerland quit his job, called a news conference, and at that news conference, and you'd have to catch it because it was reported one day in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Christian Science Monitor. There he is. He quits. He holds a press conference and has never been another word since. And he said this. This is, uh, and I'll of course abuse all of the Japanese names, but uh, this is uh, Mitsuhei Morata. And Mr. Morata, uh, the former ambassador, said, if Unit 4 collapses, this will be the most unprecedented crisis that man has ever experienced. Many scientists say if the Unit 4 collapses, not only will Japan lie in ruin, but the entire world will face serious damages. He went on to say the ground beneath the plant is in fact shrinking and sinking, and the entire structure is very likely on the verge of complete collapse. There's the testimony we collected from the nuclear expert, a world-class expert, Arnold Gunderson, and he added that Fukushima is the biggest industrial catastrophe in the history of mankind. There's more cesium in just Unit 4 than in all 800 nuclear bombs that have ever been exploded above ground, and it would certainly destroy Japan as a functioning country. And so we have a fairly ominous situation. He went on to say that, you know, that earthquake had, of course, brought the plants to its knees to begin with, and another 7.0 earthquake would cause the entire fuel structure pool, a uh, uh, fuel pool structure to collapse, which would initiate this catastrophic event. And the Japanese estimate there's a 70% chance of a 7.0 magnitude earthquake, which was, would bring that all to, to ruin, to hit in any given year in Fukushima and a 98% chance of such an earthquake in the next three years. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, a year ago, there was a 6.3 in Vancouver, a seven, uh, island 7.7 .7 in uh, north of British Columbia, Canada, a 6.1 in the Philippines, etc. So the web being wonderful as it is, there's a picture of Japan and an app that you can get, and it shows the ongoing earthquakes happening real time in Japan. And it appears as little circles, like you drop a pebble in a pool. And in a pool, you know, you see the little circles appear. And as I'm watching, when we first discovered that application, a 6.3 had hit several, quite a, a distance above uh, the Fukushima plant. And it's sort of like throwing darts, you know, just at the island. When one of those quakes gets close enough, then you can expect that to fall apart. <coughs> Uh, there's a world-class expert, uh, Dr. Roger Staley, and I had the good fortune of interviewing him coming back from TEPCO at the request of the Japanese government to give his opinion on what was happening. His report, which in truth is confidential, and I'm not going to reveal this, so <laughs> just shows you that you really shouldn't talk to people on uh, that turn. Um, I asked him if I could tell this, and he said I could. He told them there's a 100% chance that that will collapse within four years. That was his report. And there's already an agreed 98% chance of an earthquake. So we're just talking about unbelievable probabilities that that will come down and unleash a vast amount of cesium. What's going to happen because of those tracer dyes that I mentioned, that cloud will go up, will be caught by the jet streams above the island, they'll be brought worldwide, I'll give you that documentation in a minute, and which means right here in River City, it was only a small time before we would be confronted with that. 
When the fallout first happened in Fukushima, that first cloud circled the world in only 21 days. <clears throat> and um, uh, I'm going to give you a bit more data because I want to sort of establish clearly what is the problem before we talk about doing anything about it. And they did a computer model of the debris from uh, the tsunami that struck Japan. <clears throat> and they estimated it would reach the west coast of the U.S., British Columbia, Alaska, Baja, California, in roughly two to three years. That's from that March 11, 2011 date. <clears throat> so radiation debris is already reaching the west coast. They expect the mammoth wave of that system to approach in three years. The Congressional Research Service of the U.S. reported and so recently, uh, they captured 10 bluefin tuna off of San Diego. They already had 10 times the highest level ever detected in any other year. Um, the EPA data was started to be collected. And they did so for a few weeks right after uh, Fukushima. And they found cesium fallout in all of the drinking water of a dozen U.S. cities they tested. Now, after a while, that level dropped after the initial ex explosion and tsunami, etc. And so, since the EPA saw it dropping, they said there's no other problem, and they stopped testing. So, you know, it's best to not know these things. But uh, uh, I'm, we're here this evening because perhaps uh, we can convert some of this knowledge to something productive. And a few ominous more details. Um, after the fallout, deaths in the U.S. rose 4.4% from 2010 to 2011 in the 14 weeks after the Japanese fallout. To kind of put that in perspective, it was only 2.3% increases in the prior 14 weeks. Infant deaths in Fukushima have risen 1.8% compared to the previous period of a decrease of 8.37%. The seaweed off of Southern California is testing 500% times higher radioactive iodine than anywhere else in the entire U.S. and Canada. And um, uh, I think that the, um, and the estimates by one of the major research groups pointed out, it looks like the Hawaiian Islands are already surrounded by major radiation flow. It should crash into the U.S. and Canada by December 2013, which, of course, by now, after that report, is not that far away. And they estimate by March of 2014, just shortly a year from this seminar, the entire northern North Pacific should be fully polluted with radiation. And let's just look at uh, Japan for just a moment. There's a Dr. Suzuki, a Japanese physician, uh, testing children in uh, Japan. The rate of thyroid cysts and nodules in children is already 43.7% uh, of all children tested are showing thyroid cysts and nodules, uh, which is 20 times higher than previously. And it's estimated that 36% of all children in the Fukushima prefecture have abnormal thyroid growths. And they examined 38 38,000 children and 13,000 have cysts or nodules bigger than 5 millimeters and this was reported in the sixth report of the Fukushima Prefecture Health Management Survey. So, you know, there's just a lot of bona fide, uh, real hard data about what is actually happening. And the Japanese Institute of Radiologic Sciences reported that it was believed that some children were exposed to lifetime doses of radiation just from that single event. <clears throat> Very interesting physician, uh, Dr. Uh, Michel Fernet, a medical professor at the University of uh, Basel, Switzerland, went to the Fukushima Medical University, met with four physicians, and he reported that on the web, the uh, interview, <clears throat> uh, and he said that um, he met with physicians in cardiology, urology, internal medicine, and ophthalmology. They were completely unaware 
of what radiation contamination looks like in those areas. They were surprised to see patients with myocardial infarction, diabetes, eye diseases, and they were, he was told a directive was given by the Fukushima Medical University not to mention radiation problems to anyone. Uh, one of the young professors took him to the side, a professor of ecology. He said he tried to study nuclear disasters on the children, and those began to receive uh, very dire threats. And the rest of the faculty simply fell in line. So, you know, there is a certain amount of information there to be gathered, and a great deal of information that isn't going to be made available unless you dig that out. And I had been at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, and at the time, uh, Dr. Ernest Sternglass was a professor of radiation physics in the University of Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh School of Medicine, who I know. He wrote a book, Secret Fallout, Low-Level Radiation from Hiroshima to Three Mile Island. What he showed was that all the research led to the most tragic conclusion that the unborn fetus was hundreds or thousands of times more sensitive to radiation than anyone had ever suspected. And so, you know, our children, our grandchildren, etc. And that publication showed uh, what the actual impact is, especially on the young, because they're constantly growing. And those safety levels then that we read about aren't <coughs> pertinent to youngsters whatsoever. Let me just remark before I then move to uh, turning, uh, I want to uh, let Laverne comment, but um, I want to just remark on why all of this is available, why these are governmental reports, why Japan is issued uh, by the various agencies these reports, and yet a lot of you probably simply were not aware of it, uh, or the U.S. reports of the increases in cesium, radioactive iodine, etc. And there's essentially a blackout in mainstream media uh, in terms of this uh, problem in general. Um, and, and we'll talk about that more later. But part of it is, what could you do with the information anyway? You know, it's sort of like a disaster. Are we going to evacuate Tokyo? You know, is that you know, a sensible concept? No, it's not possible. Uh, later I'll give you, in fact, I want to just remark, you know, about the uh, already maximum levels of radioactivity found in the Tokyo drinking water. So the question is, what is to be done? And the reason for the seminar this evening is not to uh, uh, a tackle or attack the nuclear industry, and that's not the target tonight. And what is available and what is uncovered and known in the medical literature, in the published peer-reviewed medical literature, are those simple things that either prevent radiation damage, that you can actually get simply yourself off the web, um, uh, and then there are things that will reverse damage. And so there is, in, in a sense, we're able to know the problem tonight because we can know that there is something that's possible, that's doable, that's straightforward, and I want to give you just a little bit of that science uh, to give you the confidence uh, to know about what that is. You know, one, uh, Tepco says, not to worry, uh, you know, I sort of think, well, what can they say after all? Uh, it's been estimated originally that it would cost 200 billion to clean up the losses. Those estimates are now at 300 billion. And the most recent New York Times report puts that at 500 billion. You know, imagine OPPD, you know, on the order of TEPCO, confronting 500 billion in expenditures. It's just an inconceivable number. And so the government loaned actually TEPCO 169 million, and we didn't talk about that, but you know, it's sort of a spit in the ocean. Uh, and one of the goals, so particularly the taping of the seminar, and is to look for a larger documentary to ultimately bring more of the world's muscle behind the cleanup because, um, as TEPCO estimated, at least 40 years to tackle this problem. Well, there's a 99.999% chance it will blow up in four years. So, you know, a 40-year horizon is simply unacceptable. <clears throat> um, let me just remark about a few key things to bring it home in terms of the local situation, and I invite Laverne to comment about Fort Calhoun. 
Uh, let's go to France. Uh, the French research body on radioactivity, called uh, CRIRAD, kind of a version of our EPA, uh, began measuring iodine-131 after Fukushima. And they said, uh, they announced that all pregnant women and infants were at risk for consuming, well, risky behavior. What was that? In France, that has to be clarified. And that risky behavior is drinking fresh milk or vegetables. Okay, and if you engage in that kind of risky behavior, uh, then you are, uh, have increased your risk for a severe intake of iodine-131. <clears throat> they detected radioactive iodine-131 in the rainwater off of southeastern France, and then the French Institute for Radiologic Protection and Nuclear Safety uh, had announced that in normal times there is no trace of iodine-131 in the detectable whatsoever in the rainwater or milk. So I just wanted to make that clear. And here's the interesting geological fact to recall. The distance from Fukushima to that part of France is the same distance as Fukushima is to Omaha. And so just to kind of give you a feel. RPEPA stopped sampling. They did sample, as I say, the drinking water in 12 cities initially, uh, found it contaminated, and, and then stopped sampling, and also announced there was no further problem, which I find to be not a lot of science I've come to know a lot. <clears throat> There's a sister city to Omaha in Japan, uh, uh, Shitsu Oka. Uh, Shitsu, Shitsu Oka. <clears throat> and, um, let's look at a couple of reports from there, and then we'll go to, even locally, uh, Fort Calvin. And there's a newspaper, um, Asahi uh, Shimbun, which I'm sure I did pay with the name, though, if those in Japanese is much better, uh, it's the Morning uh, Sun newspaper in English, uh, if it were translated. And they reported that in Hiroshima and the uh, Kyoto University Studies, <clears throat> that in samples, more than the government's 30-kilometer or 18-mile evacuation zone, they're only evacuating that to 12 miles, and there was over 400 times the normal levels, uh, that they, and they reported that. <clears throat> and so they went on and found that the cesium-137 levels, very dangerous uh, level of radiation, <clears throat> uh, was running uh, between 590, actually the becquerels per cubic meter, it's a measure of the amount of radiation, up to 2 million becquerels per cubic meter. And to put that in perspective for you, and that when it exceeded a half a million becquerels, the Soviets declared that to be a required evacuation zone. And so the Soviets were evacuating when it hits a little over half a million, and the paper was reporting levels from a half a million to two million. And, but there is no evacuation, and the point was that we need to be thinking about this. Given that they are not utilizing any of the health sciences, I mean, it's sort of understandable what are you going to do. You know, it's sort of like there's a problem in Omaha where not all going to leave. And, but nonetheless, the problem is real. The, um, just a remark uh, about the uh, one of the Japanese, uh, two, two Japanese cities. Um, uh, in Tokyo, the tap water uh, was, uh, as I mentioned, tested. And to quote, radiation in Tokyo's tap water rose to twice the level acceptable for infants 12 days after the nuclear accident. So it's already twice the acceptable level for infants, and they went on to report they can expect the, 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 uh, the contamination level to get much worse with each passing day, which means that it's just a matter of time when it will pass the acceptable level for you know, youngsters and then adults. And the water in particular in Tokyo contained 210 decibels of iodine, um, and that makes it unacceptable for children to drink and that soon reaches a level uh, to interpret that for uh, <clears throat> adults. Tokyo is 132 miles from Fukushima. Now, 
uh, that's quite a distance from the government in the sense of saying after 12 miles things are okay, maybe even after 18 miles, <clears throat> but this is the kind of measures that are being picked up 132 miles away. One report, just because some of you uh, would be interested in terms of, of the uh, sister city, <clears throat> uh, the following happened in June of 2011. Uh, for those who are aware of it, the, uh, one of the great exports of uh, Shizuoka is tea, and it's renowned for their teas for that area. And the French government, uh, in fact, seized the tea from Japan uh, at Charles de Gaulle Airport in June because the European maximum limit is 500 becquerels per kilo, just whatever that is. And, but the shipment of tea was exceeding 1,038 becquerels. So it already had twice the maximum acceptable levels, and so the tea was seized. <clears throat> and uh, the embarrassing part was that it was reported that the uh, uh, Shizuka Prefectural Government had told a Tokyo-based Daewoo company not to post on its website uh, this condition of the radioactive material and the retailer said that uh, they were told not to disclose the findings because it might cause unwarranted harm to the tea growers. And well, I can say that would, um, but you know, it's kind of ominous that they were getting that kind of level. Uh, mushrooms uh, reported in uh, October 2012 for the same uh, city uh, was reporting 350. And I'll give you a uh, Beckles per kilo. Uh, I'll give you a measure of that. But our maximum in the US would be 170. So you know, we're running twice the acceptable levels of on, and this is ongoing emitting radiation. Uh, these Beckles measure how much is constantly pouring out. And I'll, uh, we'll discuss later, and I'll give you a, a handout. The Billy Sievis, which your dosimeter badge, which we'll talk about also later is measuring is how much accumulation you have gotten. Uh, but the Beckles is a measure of how much is pumping out constantly per unit of stuff, in this case a kilo or a liter or something. <clears throat> so um, uh, I mention that uh, for two reasons. The, um, it's 218 miles from Fukushima to uh, Shizuoka. <clears throat> That is really hardly any at all because, as I reported earlier, you're picking up not only on the west coast of the U.S. and you're not only picking up in cities around the country, you're not only picking up in France, all kinds of dire measures. So in truth, it would not be surprising that the sister city would have a problem. And I'll make only one last comment, and then I want to uh, turn things over uh, a little bit to the Verne and look at the uh, for Calhoun situation, and, but um, the, there was an interesting event. The governor, Governor uh, Kawakatsu, who is the governor of the uh, uh, Shizuoka Prefecture, came to New York for a press conference. He said, I've come to declare certified, which I had in my hands, he said, that our tea is perfectly safe. Because, you know, a lot of people, the tea is safe, you can now buy that. It's a very, very well-respected popular tea. And the certificate showed that it was only emitting now 175 becquerels per kilo. And that's below the maximum of the European Union, or France, and it can be imported. And now the embarrassing fact was brought up that in America, the maximum happens to be 170. So of course, it's an illegal substance that he was bringing to show that was perfectly safe. Uh, so you know, the dynamics here are understandable, they're complicated, they're challenging. Um, and, uh, and, and the bottom line is it actually needs to be um, addressed. Uh, my last comment, and I want them to make some remarks, but I only mention this because it was in yesterday's newspaper. Uh, it was in the front page of the New York Times uh, on Tuesday, and it spoke about the plant again, unfortunately. Groundwater is pouring out of the Fukushima plant, ravaging the, bu the buildings at 75 gallons a minute. Uh, 
and they go on to report that TEPCO plans to chop down a forest on the edge and to make room for storage tanks to pour the cesium polluted water because they have nowhere else to put it. And all the ground pits where they were putting, putting it have begun to sprung leaks. It's about a half a mile from the coast, by the way. And so here's the quote that I'll leave you with. The water keeps increasing every minute. This is uh, Masuyuki Ono, the general manager of TEPCO. It's increasing every minute, no matter whether we eat, sleep, or work. <clears throat> uh, it feels like we're constantly being chased, but we're doing our best to try to stay ahead. <clears throat> and so they have this sea of storage tanks filled with cesium water. Uh, we'll cut down another forest and put another sea of tanks at the moment, all of which are very close. And we can only hope that an earthquake didn't hit that area because those tanks have an expected lifespan of about three years. And of course, the other question you would say is, well, if there are hundreds and hundreds of tanks already stored and more being built to store, what do you do after three or four years? Because that cesium is, of course, destroying the inside of the tank because it's radioactive, and for which, you know, TEPCO is really out of its sleep. So I'll leave you with this summary. And one, we have a world-class event that occurred of enormous size and scope, and mostly not reported, I think, because there was, well, what can we do? You know, what are we going to do? And the answer was, well, I don't know. So it's sort of like information you can't use. And it requires a massive, mammoth international effort rather than let this poor uh, public utility company try to, to bail their high out, which is not going to happen. And in the meantime, I think the factual data suggests it will, in fact, be impacting us and our children and our grandchildren in actually measurable, significant ways. And there are things we can do right now that will, in fact, protect us with a modest amount of compliance effort you know, and order from the web or wherever. Uh, so, next, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, Laverne uh, Traya. Laverne is an expert uh, and has been expertly studying the Fort Calhoun nuclear plant for a very, very long time. And has been following and monitoring that uh, since the OPPD, as you know, is a uh, you know, community owned entity. He's sort of a, uh, we're all tiny owners of the company. And a report on those efforts because it too was struck by a flood, and it too was shut down, and it too had fires, etc., etc. And I'll ask Laverne to try to give us uh, his snapshot of careful study of what that situation is. Laverne? Thank you. So, how many people have been following the forecast under the paper? The new, the new news? How many people believe it's shut down because of the flood? Is that what everybody believes? Well, that's not true. It's what the paper and the press wants you to believe. It was not shut down for the flood. It was shut down because there was a fire. It wasn't just one fire. There were four fires total. And that's something else that you're not really told. It's just a small fire, is what the press always say. So just to kind of get that really clear, it shut down because a fire started in the control room. The smoke went into, uh, which is not supposed to do each of the fires and each control panels are supposed to be contained. And then that smoke went into the next box, which then shut down the entire control room, which then locked them out of their control room, which clearly they didn't have control anymore. So that's what happened. And the flood was just incidental. It just came along at the same time. Uh, they were currently in a cold shutdown. The NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the staff at the Texas office wanted to red flag them for the plant, which would call for an immediate shutdown. But the bosses over at the NRC said, well, they're currently in a cold shutdown for refueling, so why don't we just put them in a 0350 committee, which is a group of NRC people who, quote, give them a chance to fix their problems. So the 0350 committee was, hasn't been used for over 10 years. They actually had to pull fine paperwork, figure out how to assemble it and put it together. And now our nuclear power plant has the most oversight in the entire country. So the NRC has decided it is the least safe nuclear power plant in the country. 
Hence, it's in the 0350 committee. It's the only nuclear power plant in a 0350 committee. So it's a nuclear power plant that's in a lead all by itself. There is no comparison to it. Now, <clears throat> when did the problem start? 1964, when they designed the plant. 1968, by the time they built it. The design basis documents, which are blueprints, and, and, and the documents that tell you what is supposed to be there. They built it, they have design basis documents, and then you have as-built documents. Of course, they did not match. What they built is not what they designed. And then recently, the NRC discovered that the design basis documents, or the as-built documents, don't even match what's currently sitting there. So for 40 years, they've been running this plant without any kind of real document that tells them what's really there. So that's just another kind of, so from the beginning, we started generating power in 74. <clears throat> this is just a side note. Your current CEO, Gary Gates, started with OPPD as a young engineer in 72, moved to Fort Calhoun in 74, worked all positions at the nuclear power plant from 74 to 89, where they promoted him to vice president of nuclear in 1990. Now what's significant about the 80s is that we ended up on the top 10 of the worst nuclear power plants in the country in 1988. Because by 85 to 88, the nuclear power plants that we built in the 60s and 70s had now gotten beyond what they call the new break-in period, where the thing is broke in, it's running, we know how it's going. So they did a big giant study across the country, and we were number seven of the top 10 worst nuclear power plants in the country. So that was in 88. So Mr. Gates had worked all positions in the plant throughout the 80s, became the vice president of nuclear, and now he's our current CEO, and that happened in 2007. Now, in 2000, they decided to extend the license, and in 2004, they decided to upgrade, which was to get more power out of the plant. Well, in, by 2007, they discovered that seven concrete beams were beyond their design basis, and these beams were holding up the nuclear head, and their shelves holding up the cooling systems. So any small earthquake, those shelves are not actually designed to hold the weight they're currently holding. So that was discovered in 2007. And I just want to point out that none of the fixes throughout the year. So in the 80s, they had discovered that the NRC put out a memo saying that there's, get back to the stuff, there's a containment building around the nuclear power plant which should contain any kind of nuclear explosion or any kind of radiation release. There are 560 holes which have uh, wires and pipes and all kinds of things going through them. And they had originally put in Teflon seals. By the mid-80s, um, it was discovered that they would not hold back radiation or heat. They would dissolve in an accident. So a memo was sent out to change those. Well, our Fort OPPD decided to only change some of them. They were confused by the memo and because they, they, they changed safety-related wires. In other words, if a wire went to the cooling system, that's safety-related. If the wire went to the AM radio, well, that's not safety-related, so we didn't change those. As explained, up to the very last meeting of a month ago, OPPD still seems very unclear about every single hole in the containment building is considered safety related mm -hmm. because it's supposed to contain the radiation and, and the meltdown. And they're still saying, well, we changed the safety related ones, you know, and it's been explained to them by the federal NRC commissioners, it's been explained to them by me, it's been explained to them that every single one of those penetrations are considered safety related. Up to the last meeting, they are still constantly using that old language of that some are and some aren't. I just want to point that out. Currently, mm -hmm. you can, I saw you don't just like it. Anytime you want to find spot, I'll keep going on. So anyway, so that, that's, your, that's your major problem. Now what the flood did was the flood just demonstrated that they're below a flood level in which if all the dams above Fort Calhoun broke, there would be the, the, the intake valves to the intake vents that bring water in to cool the reactor would be jammed up and they wouldn't be able to use them because debris would hit them and would go open and close them because the water levels would be behind, beyond them. So that's what the flood really told us this time, was that, that, they, that they, just, they just barely made it. 
you know, through this particular flood. It got up to, um, what is it, 10, 000, or 1014, and they're designed for 1021, so it was really, really close, you know. So, but if all the dams broke up upstream, yeah, they would be completely inundated, which they disagree with. They, they have their own experts that say that's not true. Now, 2004, the Corps of Engineers advised them to raise their flow levels. They said, no, our engineers said we don't need to, so poo poo. They did not do it. 2010, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission said, hey, we need to raise your flow levels. They said, no, our engineers said we don't need to. And then by 2011, they have water in the buildings and they have a major flood on their hands, which then now they're raising the flood levels because they can't restart ever until the NRC says they can. Now, I want you to be very clear about this. There is a nuclear power plant that has been in cold shutdown for over 25 years, bilking those ratepayers in Illinois, giving them a chance to restart it. 25 years of power plant has been shut down, giving them a chance to restart. The NRC does not care how long it takes. They will have a restart committee. They'll come in and look at your stuff. They will give you a chance until the end of time. Because it's not up to them. It's up to you, the owner of the power plant. And we are all citizen owners of the power plant. And, and I just want to say, anytime you testify or go to the front of OPPD and they ask you who you are, which they do it all the time, you just say, I am a citizen owner. And you are a board of directors. And I think you're screwing up. And that's the only reason I need to be here. Period. You know? and, and you don't need any other reason. You pay an electric bill, you have the right to go in there and tell them anything you want. And so I, they do it all the time, these politicians, which try to tear people apart, you know, kind of, who are you, you know, like, well, I'm your boss, and that's the bottom line. And I really want to impress upon that, because we're the only state that has a public utility. We're the only people who actually own our public utility. Everybody else is private utilities, you have two commissions and boards, and that kind of stuff. So anyway, there's that. So the nuclear power plant is unsafe. It's already been run for uh, 40 years. They've extended for another 20. They've told you in 2000 that it would be $250 million over 30 years to run the nuclear power plant. They've currently spent a billion dollars, one billion dollars since they told me it was only $250 million, a billion by 2013. So 13 years, they spent a billion dollars, and you have a nuclear power plant that's in a 0 to 50 committee, which is the worst condition it could be in, and it's currently shut down. So you spent a billion dollars to run this thing into the ditch. And somehow it's going to be cost effective. They spread out the cost over 30 years. They raised your rates every single year for 10 years. Every single year for 10 years. Every single year for 10 years. They are nipping at your walls every single year for 10 years. Now, the last board meeting, the last executive meeting I went to, it was hilarious because they said, the, lady, the, 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 the board director lady said, hey, McGuire says, is, is the overruns because of the nuclear power plant? He said, no, all departments have financial overruns. I just want to point out that they just hired Exelon Corporation to take over the day-to-day -day operations and then assign every single vice president that they currently have a duty to the nuclear power plant. And I asked them, is the nuclear power plant paying this vice president? Or is the distribution part of your company paying for this vice president? Well, the vice president is paid for distribution, head of distribution. The vice president of the coal plant is, is getting paid by that. So those are other ways of, of, of watering down exactly what it costs. And you didn't use any of these vice presidents for the last 30 years. You hired an excellent corporation to take over and to show us how to do it, and then you assign all your vice presidents to it. Every single vice president of OPPD now has extra duties, and they gave every single one of them a raise because of those extra duties. So those raises are coming out of their departments, not coming out of the department. So it's just another way of hiding the cost. Recently, just about hiding the bus, it was asked uh, to give the breakdown of 135, 145 million expenditure. Uh, they told the lady that it would cost them five thousand dollars to assemble that information, and that's what she would have to do because it's not public. So we're going to cost you twenty-five hundred to five thousand dollars for them to tell us what they actually spent 143 million dollars on, which is in the last quarter. That's not even. That's just one quarter. And the only reason it was asked because they admitted to everybody that they had the breakdown. When asked, do you have, yes, we have a money total of what we're spending on. Okay, can I see it? It'll cost you $5,000 to be able to present this to you. So if you think your public utility should withhold balance, what they're doing with their money, yeah, you know, then great. 
but if you don't, you should call them up and say, you know, publish these numbers and say, well, we don't want my ratepayers in my district giving you paying for your information. So when I suggested put it on the web, put it on their website, give it to all your ratepayers, because I think they would all like to know what you're doing with our money. You know, then that's a solution, but it's not something they like, of course. So I'm just letting you know that our public utility our, is the dirtiest public utility on the planet. And that is why I've stayed here. I could have lived in Oregon. I have land in Arizona. I've lived in solar villages. I really do enjoy living my life. But we currently have a, they currently believe that coal ash is non toxic. I have that on the video. I just published it today. They currently believe that the Fort Calhoun and generating nuclear waste forever, basically burdening your children and your grandchildren with a tax on their economies because they have to pay for the maintenance of that fuel, even if they don't get nothing from it. So when you go to decommission this thing in 20 years, all the rate payers at the time are going to have to pay for decommissioning, and they're not going to need one kilowatt of power. They currently don't have enough money to decommission it, and it's been open for 40 years. How is that for kind of managerial responsibility? When you created the thing, you should have put an extra penny on everybody's bill, and that penny or two pennies or whatever it takes, figure it out, you got mathematicians, and say, hey, you know, in 20 years, you better have a billion dollars sitting here to decommission this so we have an option. Because at an executive meeting, the board of directors said that one of the bad reasons why we can't decommission it is because we don't have the money. So, to me, that's just irresponsible. So you're going to put it on the future, they're not going to get any power from this thing, and they're going to have to pay for the decommissioning and the storage of waste. That is a tax on your future economy. As a cost that the grandchildren have to pay, and they get no benefit, none. Any questions that I want to ask, by the way, and let, we'll let Fran go next before I'm not sure there are a lot of questions. Sure, sure. And Fran, um, uh, Fran, of course, will give her own uh, insights uh, on the to Japan, as to this country, as key people in Japan. Will you kind of give us your own perspective, if you will. About the earthquake and then what's happened after that. Right. So I, lived, I was uh, born in Scottsbluff and raised here in Omaha. We graduated from Austin and UNO. And I uh, married a Japanese man and went to live on a dairy farm there. And um, I was there when the earthquake happened. I was in a new house. We just built it three or four years earlier, and it just started moving. It was surreal, the strangest thing. And then um, the, everything went black, and for about two days, we had no electricity. And uh, we pretty much cleaned out the refrigerator. I guess it would be like uh, you know, going through a hurricane or a tornado here. You do what you can. And then um, my husband heard up. We started watching the nuclear power plant exploding, and he said, you have to leave. You and my son, you have to go. So we said, OK, and we packed up, and we started getting, well, when the roads were clear and we could get gas, then the bus company called us and said, you can take the three-hour bus ride to the airport. And right before we pulled into the um, airport on the bus, um, my husband called and said, put all your clothes on and cover your head and put on a mask and put on your gloves. And it, it was in March, so it was still cold. The Japanese always had masks, so we always, so we had masks. And he said, there's a radiation cloud over the airport and you're going to get off and you should, you know, go inside and stay as far away from any windows and doors that you can. And I go surreal, and I kind of laughed about it. You know, this can't really be happening, and I can't really be in the middle of all this. And uh, so we left Japan, and I started reading articles and trying to find out, you know, what was happening and you know what it meant for our home. And it, it just is weird because, um, you know, when I talk to my husband, he says, "Well." You know, things are getting better, and uh, you know, things are starting to happen again. 
but he's lost over 50% of his cows in the last, what, two years now? Is this the second anniversary or third anniversary? And he can't figure out why, but um, it's uh, probably because after the radiation cloud left um, the airport, it went and did a U-turn and went up to our mountain and we're um, north west of the airport in a prefecture that um, borders Fukushima, but it's separated by a mountain range. So my husband kept saying, you know, we're safe because of the mountains. It, it won't come over the mountains. And uh, so when I would start to send him articles about what people were saying in different parts of the world, he would say, you know, the government would tell us. And uh, it's, uh, it's just really unbelievable. But when he reads the things that I sent him, he said, this can't be right. You know, the government has told them some of the things that you've said tonight. Um, but, um, you know, I don't know why. I mean, he has a reason he can get out. If he weren't taking care of his mother, he would leave today. Um, but he doesn't want to leave his family farm um, because that's his, um, that's been in his family, you know, since the beginning of time, beginning of Japan. And all the people there are our relatives and his family. So, um, is there an explanation of why I have to come? No. He can't figure it out, and he said, I know I haven't had to pay taxes for the first time in two years. For the last two years, he hasn't had to pay taxes because he's not making any money. And, uh, but they're still selling his milk, even though the radiation dropped on our, on our mountain, and they banned the fishing and eating of the fish at the top of our mountain, which is a volcanic lake there. And it used to be a place where people came and drank water, spring water, and they were carried away and by the barrels full. And now nobody goes there for that. All the fishing industry is gone. I, I just don't know how they can continue to uh, allow the milk to be used um, because the cows are dying. My husband has um, had some fractures in his toes, in his feet, in his ankles. And uh, nobody will say why. But apparently the radiation binds with the calcium in the milk. And it causes, uh, this is one of the problem, brittle bones. But the doctors won't talk about this. So I went back a year after because uh, it was also uh, the uh, memorial time for his father's death. He just passed away before the um, earthquake happened. And I met with all my old students, and they all <coughs> they all told me stories about how it affected their lives and their businesses and uh, their plans for school. And, uh, a lot of people have left our mountain. If they can go, they have left. And they've gone to places in other islands to be far away. But the people, like my husband, um, you know, they can't leave. They won't leave. So it's uh, really great if we can do an international effort together. Uh, let Dr. Wong address uh, one uh, important issue is director of the Asian World Center at Creighton University, and Dr. Uh, Wong is uh, intimately aware of the interplay of all of the forces in that region, and will kind of be kind enough to give his uh, assessment of some of the other implications, sort of at a global level, and then we're going to also look at a local level too. Dr. Wong. Thank you very much. Uh, I teach. Japanese politics and Chinese politics, or Asian politics in uh, classes at Creighton. 
Um, since the Fukushima nuclear disaster happened, most of my classes um, were focusing on the impact of this uh, fallout. I enjoy tremendously with many discussions with master students regarding the subject. Oftentimes, went on to one o'clock in the morning, even two o'clock in the morning. Um, I I feel very powerless uh, being a political scientist, not a scientist per se, but understanding the scientific failure is really beyond the understanding of a social scientist. That is a tragedy. tragedy. Um, how could we teach our children or our college students without scientific backing, just focusing on hypothetical and artificial statements without much connection to the scientific uh, research? So I think education has a big fallout in this part. So I, I just don't know how to fix it. I love Japan very much. Although I was born and raised in China. Um, I went to Japan last November. And one of the hidden purpose of going to Japan to try to get all my friends to know, please leave Japan as soon as possible. But I didn't tell them to come to Oma. <laughs> I wish really um, <laughs> for the home should really be shut down. And then I can tell them come to Omaha. Um, I saw a movie, it's called The Sink of Japan, um, future exactly the city of Shinjoku, um, 2007. Tells that a part of the ocean will sink and the city will perish. The Japanese people are so resilient. Some of them left, you know, but the reluctantly left. Most of them stay. They said we want to we want to die together with our city. But with this Fukushima nuclear disaster, we will be so stupid to die with this Fukushima stuff. So people need to be <coughs> enlightened. Not because of the traditional value that we cherish so much. There are so many bad stuff embedded in the tradition that, that make us to be very, very stubborn. So I told my students basically the impact of Fukushima nuclear plant uh, of the disaster in the future. Honestly, I totally agree was with what Master Steven Ayers elaborated relating to the future of Fukushima. Um, one of the pur uh, purposes I said that I am proud is because I know the disaster is ahead of us and we need to do something fast, effectively. But very unfortunately, because of the break between the science, politicians, politics, business, capital making, money making, there was information people do not want to hear. Like the new uh, Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe, he advocated a new measure for awakening Japan, make Japan once again great power, which Japan has been a great power in the 70s, 80s. But starting 1997, Japan will not really make up because China is replacing uh, its um, manufacturing function. But this new statement from the Japanese cabinet serves nothing but a smoke that just forget about the disasters, okay? Let's unite, let's make our country a great place. It's the wrong message. People suffer from this hidden, horrible, terrible terrorists um, damaging our health damaging our children, and then it impacted hundreds of thousands of people. How could we really face up this reality that there are a slogan inspiring everybody at the same time, scientifically, we are suffering from something very, very bad that the government should hold to be accountable, but we cannot do that. 
we the people, but we the people are stupid in many ways. So I, I just want to know that um, how much Japanese people will like to stay the way that they have been. It's a new disaster. It's no longer an uh, earthquake or tsunami that we can deal with. This is a hidden enemy coming to our heart, to our blood, to our children's blood. How could we survive that? And how could we um, really make sense out of continuing to live uh, blindly? Now, political uh, amplification. A lot. Japan decided to shut down the nuclear plants gradually and followed by Germany, France, Taiwan, South Korea. But there are major countries like the United States, China, Russia, Iran. He said, no, we're okay. We're okay. We, we are not going to, to shut down or, or gradually phase out. There is a reason for that. So the development theory that advocated by a lot of political scientists in, in the past I said that only the modernization can make people happy. That's totally wrong. Modernization has benefited a lot of people. At the same time, much more sacrifice have been also um, at, at its disposal. So I just come to a point that I don't know as a political scientist, um, how to educate our young children or college students to be responsible in its real essence, other than just getting a degree, find a job, and continue to do what really is not benefiting the humanity. So economically, Japan-China relations continue because China does not want to say anything about the Japan made cars because we need cars you know, to satisfy people's need for luxury time. We want to drink, drink, drink Japanese tea, but honestly, uh, China has also the problem that we share from a different perspective, like the lead contaminated toys and uh, poison stuff in the pet food, or all the, all the uh, uh, very bad stuff in the food that we sell to Americans. So many things that we tie together. We don't want to reveal the real color. We just want to just keep going on as if. Business as usual, that's taking wrong. I just feel that's taking wrong. Let me just stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Um, let, me, let me just remark one thing. I want to move to a very positive component of what you can actually do, and then I want to open up for questions and answers. Uh, in my interview with Dr. Roger Staley, his firm has 16 of the 16 current nuclear plants under construction. The firm was offered all 60 of the current plants being built between now and the year uh, 2022. Uh, they can only take 16 of them. And, and he doesn't build them. He finds the flaws in the design. Every single contract that he has on plants being built in America and other parts of the world are all fatally flawed. All of the plants, and there are estimated to be 300 to be built in China by 2060, are all professionally assessed, fatally flawed. Just to accentuate that finding by one world-class expert, our most recent head of the Nuclear Regulatory Agency, who just, who just ended his term and retired, two weeks later gave a press conference and said, Every single solitary nuclear plant, and he's the chairman, remember, of the Nuclear Regulatory Agency of every single nuclear plant in the country, every single one he said is fatally flawed, which you may have caught in the paper, and needs to be closed down, you know, and total flaws are fixed. And so it's very consistent, just to, you know, they're a high level, uh, of the highest level experts. They did say, why did you wait two weeks after you terminated the head of the commission to say that? And he said, I love this, and then I just got around to looking at it <laughs> carefully. So, uh, you know, and also he was chairman. So, <clears throat> let me uh, add, I want to add at this juncture uh, an extremely positive note before, because it's part of the reason to come together tonight. <clears throat> and that is, uh, we, uh, I don't know if we're going to close all the nuclear plants, the odds are against it. 
and say that they're going to close the ones that are fatally flawed. But here's the research on the health science side in terms of what is possible to be done. And first, I'm going to very, very briefly give you in ways that will be, by the way, impossible to follow, into, I realize as I went through this, with your notes because of the detail. And so I wrote down every single solitary detail that I'm just about to tell you, and I ran it off last night as a handout, and so you will have, at the end of this brief period, absolutely every single solitary thing I'm just about to tell you, and it includes all the citations to the medical literature, which, of course, I won't verbalize while we go through it. The following seven things are of utmost critical import to know about. Many of you know, well, let's say you can buy potassium iodine tablets that will help you. Interestingly, that totally, turns out to be totally wrong. Is that amazing? The medical of Laverne is working because he bought some potassium iodide tablets, told me about it. And here's how that works. The potassium in the potassium iodine tablet goes to the thyroid and grabs a hole like Velcro onto these sites, these receptor sites, so cesium can't bind. Two things wrong with that. The amount of potassium in that tablet is a spit in the ocean. It won't possibly do the job. The average American is direly deficient in potassium. And so that potassium will be taken up. So you will not essentially bind against any of the potassium to protect you against the cesium, which is your most dangerous component, by taking the potassium iodide. Number two is potassium iodide. Now the thyroid will, in fact, have that iodide hold on and keep radioactive iodide from grabbing a hold. All the other organs of the body don't work that way. The eye has iodine receptors, the heart, the breast tissue, on and on. So it's not going to protect you against any of that. So the potassium iodide tablet just borders on a joke. And what you need, in fact, and, I'll, and I itemize, and in fact, I'll show you, I packed one of that in the kit, is a threefold potassium iodide for sun protection, sodium iodide for more protection, and then what's called molecular iodide to bind against those sites so it can't grab a hold. And unless you set that up, your potassium iodide tablets are hardly going to do you much good at all. That's kind of amazing. The second critical thing the Russians uncovered at Chernobyl was uh, ginkgo, ginkgo biloba. And they took 25 patients, and we'll read all that in the detail, put them in two different groups, gave one 120 milligrams of the right kind, etc. And the ones that took it uh, pre prevented DNA damage. The ones without it all suffered DNA damage. Of course, you could do that in Russia with Chernobyl. You can't obviously run such experiments in the USA. Let's radiate and kill people and see which ones, you know, live. It's considered an unethical experiment, and rightly so. But Chernobyl provided that kind of data. And they took blood, put ginkgo with blood. Only one out of 20 of the white cells died, blood, white blood cells died. Without it, one out of every three. So it's a huge blood protector. They found that it protected against radiation damage, and when they gave it to people after Chernobyl, long after the explosion, it still produced an enormous amount of protection. So this is the second one. But what you'll read in the paper in that handout is, you can't just go to the store and buy ginkgo. You'll buy a bottle of cheap ginkgo, it's the whole ginkgo. But you need the standardized ginkgo. You need the 24% standardized with glycosides at 24% level. And finally, if you look at all the bottles, you'll see some that say, oh, this has less than five parts per million of ginkgolytic acid. What's that all about? Well, that's a highly detrimental component that's within ginkgo. So you need to buy, as it were, the right bottle of stuff. And <clears throat> without that detail, you simply don't wind up with the right protection. Uh, in terms of, of the third major item, which is NAC for N cell cysteine. Uh, NAC is a component, what does it do? Well, I'll tell you. The body makes something called glutathione. 
This is the natural antioxidant the body does a fantastic job to bind particles, heavy metals, it detoxes, protects your uh, DNA, uh, do DNA repair, protects your immune system, blah, blah, blah. So you might say, Steve, why don't I just go buy a bottle of glutathione? I can see it in the shelf right there at GNC. Small problem. Glutathione will not pass through the intestinal tract. It's destroyed by the stomach acid. Yes, you can buy it. B, you'll get nothing out of it. Now, NAC is a precursor of glutathione, which means when you take it, it kicks off a storm of glutathione in the body. So NAC is the thing that you actually need. By the way, you know, it's not in the kit, which I'll just show you. If you don't have adequate levels of magnesium, then you'll diminish your body's ability to kick off this storm. And so you do want to have adequate magnesium. <clears throat> it's uh, things like you need about 400 milligrams a day. And you want to actually take a magnesium tablet for your own health. Uh, an ounce of almonds has 80. So you need five ounces of almonds. A half a cup of spinach has 80. So obviously you may not have two and a half cups of spinach a day, but just to give you a feel for the things. Raisin bran, 80. Cashew, 75. A half a cup of soybean, 75. An ounce of just mixed nuts, 65. Uh, and an ounce of peanuts, 50. So for those of us who are going to have a uh, half a can of peanuts for home free for that day. And but just keep in mind that you actually have to have the right kinds of stuff just helpfully to make these things work. And by the way, to have adequate levels of potassium, you think, I'll just go to the store, there it says potassium, I'll buy a little bottle. If you check carefully, nearly every bottle has 99 milligrams. Why? The government said you can't sell more than 100 milligrams, so it has 99. How much potassium do you need a day? 3,500 to 4,500 milligrams a day. So unless you're willing to take 45 of the uh, capsules a day, those capsules will do you no good. It's virtually impossible to buy without prescription potassium. And so keep in mind things like bananas have 600, cantaloupe has 500, a cup of lima beans has 1,000, uh, a cup of uh, melon has 500, uh, a cup of orange juice has 500, an ounce of uh, peanuts has 200. A baked potato has 1,000. And so you want to go to the web, you want to get adequate potassium, because unless you buy those sites with food, you will actually not be able to protect yourself against the cesium portion, and even though the iodine will be helpful. The fourth thing is our old friend Marie Tig. Uh, give you citations of material that will hand out, how it blocks whole body radiation, uh, it has a radio of, uh, protective effect, studies in China have shown how it's protective, etc. Buy green tea? No, can't do that. You have to buy green tea with at least 60% polyphenols. It's the polyphenols in the green tea that do the heavy lifting. So you'll see the itemize. It's sort of like saying, I've got pneumonia. I say, well, take a drug. Think, well, no, I think we've got to be more specific, right? Uh, you have to get the right stuff at the right dose. And so I advise for you the doses, because if you don't take them the right doses, then in fact you're not going to get those benefits. And the fifth of the seven items is alpha lipoic acid. Uh, they had an interesting experiment. They gave it to children uh, living right near Chernobyl. After 28 days, the Abstract says, the children's blood peroxidation levels fell to normal. Uh, the peroxidation of the blood basically is degrading the blood. It's just destroying it, and when it peroxidizes or oxidizes, it'll cascade, and more will just breed more. And, it's, and you can get into a spiral and die from that. And it returned totally to normal with this alpha lipoic acid, which is a very simple uh, supplement. And you need 300 milligrams, and you get all of that itemized. The other thing it does is that after you use your vitamin C and D that you're taking, your body normally discards it. Alpha lipoic acid takes it, revitalizes it, actually adds an electron to be technical, and makes it good again. And then the single cycle will be reused over and over. So it's a phenomenal recycler and helper. And the sixth thing, the, the brand name is called Pectipure. It's kind of like Tylenol. It's just a name, it doesn't mean anything. 
and but it's low molecular weight modified citrus pectin. So you can see why I gave you handouts and the notes, because you know you'll be having to take short hand. And what's low molecular weight modified citrus pectin? Well, the citrus pectin is the pith of the rind of lemons and limes and grapefruit and that sort of stuff. So it's the part you throw away when you eat the fruit. That stuff has a tremendous property. Now, you can't absorb it and the body discards it like fiber. But low molecular weight forms is used by the body. It'll absorb and bind with all kinds of toxic heavy metals and it will remove them phenomenally. And so it's a major anti-toxic agent, and it's a crucial detox that you want to take. The seventh thing, and I'll show you in a moment, uh, of the grouping is what we, is a, a homeopathic uh, entity. Uh, it is uh, called Signatures uh, Immune Support Water, and in fact, it is a kind of water over which a very wide range of tonings have been sounded. Uh, and we are doing research in vibrational medicine, and many of our uh, colleagues have recommended you need some kind of solid immune support of this nature, and we decided to add the uh, signatures immune uh, water support. And what it does is it, it re-orchestrates the innate vibrations of the body, which get terribly thrown out of kilter as a function of radiation. And so it becomes a crucial component to maintain that body integrity. Um, the, uh, just to show you that, that kit, and uh, I, in the handout that I'll show you, one would not take all of these. So I stage the amount that you take in a chart, because for those here in Omaha, under current conditions, which means it hasn't blown up yet in Fukushima or at Fort Calhoun, and then there is one, and you'll have that all written out for you, just one tablet of the alpha lipoic acid, the pectopure, and a half a teaspoon of the water. That alone is your core, what we call the core regimen. And, um, and we package that under the core regimen, you know, or you can order that, buy that. It's nothing special. As you see, I actually just went and bought uh, a grouping of these things. And I found actually when I bought four total at a time, uh, because I saved on shipping, the core regimen, which you'll see on the handout, and you can buy it or do it or just email us or we'll send it to you for the same amount. Either way, it comes to the same thing. Uh, it was $67 for a two month supply. But it's actually, you'll see other places it says 65. That's because when I bought four at a time, I saved on shipping. So, yeah, I can prorate that out. And that's within about 45 cents of actually the, the final retail cost. Uh, and I'm not sure if I rounded up or rounded down, but that was very, very close. And so that two months supply uh, cost 65. And the reason I'll show you the contents of this bag is so that some of these products and you'll see, uh, the most intense level, if you lived in Japan and you were close to the radiation, then in fact, you would take two, one of these twice a day of each of these regimens. So it's the most intense regimen. And so it's, I gradated the regimen and, and point out if you're here, I recommend that. But if you're here, I recommend this. And because there's a question of cost, there's a question of compliance, and so I wanted to be sensitive to all of that. And within the kit, there's also uh, three things uh, I put, which you uh, hopefully can get in Japan. I need to ask the Japanese people to confirm this, that you can get baking soda in Japan. And baking soda is phenomenal. Uh, I document one of the researchers uh, here, I think it's Three Mile Island, but it doesn't matter. He cleaned 93% of all the uranium from the dirt just by using baking soda. You just put this in a little water and wash your fruit or your vegetables or your hands or the soles of your shoes in Japan and come back from walking outside. And so it's just an unbelievable detoxing agent for washing and cleaning. And the uh, since everyone should have, if you didn't, you should have received the disseminar radiation badge. I want to get uh, buy one for everybody and uh, get that to you. And on the one hand, 
you know, they make much more sensitive ones, which will be between fifty and hundred dollars. And I, to be honest, uh, could buy it. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the ones that you have uh, are cumulative. <coughs> they will pick up cesium, which is a gamma radiation. <coughs> and so you can put it on the back of your license uh, to keep it all the time with you. You can keep it in your shirt. But, and it will go through the wash and you forget to take it out of your shirt, but it's not that good for it. And, and it will build and show your cumulative radiation that you're slowly getting. Uh, you should have also gotten the uh, little uh, guide that comes with it that describes it and tells you exactly what it's measuring and how to take advantage of it. Uh, and then the kit, uh, just because we got a little dosimeter uh, carry case. So uh, if you keep yours in the home, you can just keep this right in the case with your dosimeter and keep a running degree of what's happening. One of our researchers, some of whom you know, uh, went from Omaha through security to Dallas-Fort Worth, DFW, and then flew on to vacation in Costa Rica. That's his stop-offs. Just two airports. Took the dosimeter badge. By the time she got to Costa Rica, she had nearly five rads. Okay, ten is your yearly total that you want. She had picked up five right there, even though we're told everything is safe. I'm just reporting, you know. Uh, the dosimeter badge will tell you as it gets darker, that you'll read how more obvious that is. And in part, which is why we did all the research, was to give people something that they can do, that the published peer-reviewed medical literature is saying will protect you against that radiation, will restore DNA damage, will detox your body, and simply not a lot of money. The total kit uh, for, if you use that, which would be in the final extreme, uh, the total purchase here was $125, um, and that's within, I think, eight cents of the exact amount, actually. Uh, sorry, round it off. And it includes uh, the book, uh, which describes all the material and all the presentation uh, and the conditions at Fukushima uh, and, the, uh, and the full write-up of the handout that I want you to have. <coughs> and one of our researchers, in fact, are making the bag kit to put it in. <coughs> so, a couple of quick summaries. On one hand, we can recognize the degree of danger that is out there. On the other hand, the reason we can is that, and I want one more single piece to tell you, and then I want the panel to take questions, uh, and we also want time to consume some of our uh, refreshments that we'll be brought for you. And there's one other fact that I need to tell you, but uh, I just want to uh, indicate that, you know, uh, again, it's, it's true that we go to the web and order this, there's nothing special about that, and put them all in the packages, uh, and the core regimen of the three, which we simply, you can simply contact us, and we send it, or you can do all the work yourself. That's why that page is so detailed. So you will be fully armed, totally capable of doing this yourself, because that's what the Therapeutics Research Institute is about, trying to get information in your hand. Um, the other thing we uncovered is so remarkable that allow me just to tell you that one thing and then we need to uh, go back to our panel and then have some time for refreshments. Uh, the radiation workers were going in the plant getting, you know, in two minutes, their year supply, probably their lifetime supply to be honest, by other measures. They come out and couldn't work for another month. You know, we're seeing some curious stuff here. And so a Japanese research institute in Japan did a phenomenal study. They took a whole group of those men, and they gave them one supplement, I'll tell you in a minute. Um, the others they didn't. The ones who took one single supplement, very tricky, I'll tell you, uh, had no radiation damage, no DNA damage, and no detectable, measurable damage whatsoever. The others, of course, were badly wounded, substantial. Quite remarkable. Uh, what they gave the first group was intravenous vitamin C, 24,000 units uh, a day, which you know, is a huge 
gigantic intravenous vitamin C infusion. And the others were, of course, badly damaged. After the damaged people came out, they then gave them the intravenous vitamin C and completely eliminated all the measurable damage. That's simply mind body. They were so detectable DNA damage, no blood peroxidation, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they reported this to the Japanese government, which said that they do not wish to receive the report. The very famous research group, they sent it to Korea, South Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore, I believe, I documented it, which, of course, all falls on dead ears because there's no problem, so you don't need a solution. All right? And the entire report was completely blacklisted, blackballed, and unavailable. The way that being what it was, they leaked it to the one organization in America that would publish it. It's the Journal of Author Molecular Medicine, actually. That particular journal, and I know I'll take your time here, uh, does this kind of stuff. And so the government refuses to index it to the standard indexing. So if you did a search, you could never find it. Now, all the board of directors are MDs, PhDs. Uh, I know some of them personally. There's thousands of publications amongst all of them. All of the journal articles are peer reviewed, and the government does not index it whatsoever, so it's not findable. There's politics in medicine, believe it or not. <clears throat> However, the Journal of Orthopedic Molecular Medicine got a hold of the report and published it. Now, here's the part we added, which I don't believe is available so far anywhere else in the world. You cannot, even in Omaha, easily probably get anybody to do 24,000 uh, uh, gra uh, uh, grams of IVC daily for you. Not going to happen. Okay. Turns out, from other research we did, there's what's called liposomal vitamin C. Now you think, I'll just starve down a bunch of C vitamins, right? Won't work. Because after three or four thousand, you get diarrhea, you seriously react, and in any case, it won't absorb from the gut into the blood. So kiss it off. Then it isn't going to happen. Liposomal vitamin C encapsulates the vitamin C in this little capsule, so it passes through the stomach, goes into the intestines, and is absorbed directly into the blood supply in a superior fashion than intravenous C. You can buy it on the web and completely undertake what this Japanese research group was able to show, was able to reverse total massive radiation damage which is actually, I think, extraordinary. And, uh, and so I found, I went to all the suppliers, and this one there, Dr. Joe Mercola, some of you may know, I know Dr. Mercola, he's a reliable guy. <clears throat> there are other suppliers, some from China and other areas, I would not recommend those. Uh, Dr. Mercola does a quality product, <clears throat> and so you can take these little capsules uh, at a lower level, equal what the Japanese discovered was a complete reversal of radiation damage and implement that even if you were right in downtown in the middle of the nuclear plant uh, on day one. So that's the kind of stuff that's out there and for me it provides a positive sense of what's going on because, uh, and so you'll have that, those, I have a handout there. Um, uh, <clears throat> next to it, uh, actually I brought because I want to see, I literally want to make for uh, these kits, which I did, because uh, I got the actual cost and saw that I saved on postage. Uh, the other three kits are there. I don't think anyone would be interested, but if you are, then you're just welcome to buy them in case anyone wishes. Uh, and there are order forms if, for those people who want us to do it. Some people are asking us, you know, just do the work for them. And we don't mind because that's TRI does that sort of thing. Uh, so that's on that uh, counter, uh, that table there on our left. Be sure to take one of the reprints home with you, though, because all of the information about the interventions is on there, including this last one I just mentioned. So it's the critical, literally, take kind of message. <clears throat> uh, let's do two things. Let's get some questions uh, from the audience right now to the panelists. Uh, we have one question. Why are the animals safe around Chernobyl uh, and the humans aren't? 
the humans are reporting vast DNA damage. There was vast amount of child, uh, children being born with all kinds of deformities. And no, the animals were not doing any better. It's one of those things like everything's okay, you know. And uh, Milano and Dr. Milano was saying the government's announced these things, you know, ex cathedra. There you are. But that, of course, doesn't mean. And so it's the incongruity that caught me. In terms of the pups, it's been speculated that they are eating the krill and low-level fish, and that this is causing poisoning. But nobody wants to examine them for radioactive poisoning. It took a major group to look at the blue tuna, fin tuna, uh, uh, to see that they were 10 times the radioactive levels. And so when you see all of a sudden these massive fish kills and the other things, some speculate, but we, tonight we're just trying to present data, that there is a, a connection. Before, uh, I, I want to take more questions from the audience. Anyone in particular? I did want to add the wild boars. Uh, the wild boars in eastern Germany are not allowed to be hunted because they're radioactive. But they overrun the small towns, and so now the government has hired hunters and paid them to go and shoot them so they don't get eaten. So the animals are affected. And the reason they're doing well is because there's no humans around them to eat them or to shoot them or to, you know, chase them out of the house. That's true. Right, within, within 12 miles, uh, within 12 miles, Chernobyl is supposed to be completely evacuated. Um, and when you look at the pictures on, uh, uh, around Fukushima, uh, the same event produced an 18 mile evacuation circle in Russia and U Ukraine. Uh, and the US, our specs say that that circle should be 50 miles. Uh, so, excuse me, around Fukushima. And in fact, Americans were advised within 50 miles that they were in the evacuation zone. Uh, so the, uh, Tokyo's water will reach the point at which, under previous regulations, everyone is supposed to evacuate. Now, uh, now that is simply solved, by the way. You increase the level that's acceptable. So our background radiation in America was about 300 millisieverts. And you say, well, that seems good. It has gone up to about 600 millisieverts in terms of this amount of radiation. So now you say, it's 600, it's background. You know, background is good. Background is not necessarily safe or good. It's just how much is in the background. And it has doubled in the last several years of the measurable background radiation. So when we change the, the, the bar, you know, then everybody can get under it. So that's one of the approaches. It's like the tea. Uh, tea at 170, uh, in America, tea with only 170 uh, uh, becquerels per kilo is now safe. But you think, you know, I don't want my tea, I, want to be, I don't want to find my tea in the dark. I, I, mean, I want to put the light on. Uh, and in Europe, you can actually have 300 units before they seize the tea, et cetera. So that's unfortunately how that will work. Other questions at the moment? Yeah. I would say that an international effort was, was mounted uh, and hypothetically the billions of dollars were there. Is there worldwide technology to come together to actually clean up Fukushima? <coughs> that is a good question. Uh, if in fact there is international muscle put behind it, is in fact it's known how to do it. And it is categorically not known in all of science to date how to clean up a complete meltdown. Okay, so that actually is not known. And it is not known, although TEPCO says they will be doing it, they also said it is not known how to remove the cesium from the water. So they have it all in the storage tanks, but that removal process is not yet known. So one of the problems uh, is that although the cleanup, if it's known, may take 40 years, 
it is known that they don't know how yet to do many of those exact jobs. Uh, here's the one scientific piece that I do know. You have in the number four plant 1,553 rods in a swimming pool 100 feet up. <clears throat> that pool is cracking. Many things can bring it down. So they have to be removed. But it is not known how you will remove them without setting them all off because out of water they'll explode. So they're going to build a 100 ton lead container into which they're going to pull the rods, so it's not known how you can take them out, to get them into the container, and where do you put a 100 ton lead container in a complex that's about to collapse? So you know, you have this slight technical problem, so many of the world scientists were saying, you know, the solution that you're going to start in, uh, they're going to start in, De in December, and the, the scientists complained bitterly, you need to put more intellectual problem solving to, four, to the fore. And TEPCO announced that you're right, we'll accelerate it and start this in November instead of December. But what they're starting is a process that doesn't have any yet known scientific approach on how to start. So two things are needed. An enormous amount of leverage, that's one of our goals this evening, was to try to move to a documentary level, find that funding, uh, I need to tell you about one other goal. Uh, and bring the scientific acumen to the table to work on it along with the international muscle to implement it. But no, it is not enough. We're going to do one thing, I just want to tell you about it. We're going to create a citizen's radiation watch. We're going to get more sophisticated Geiger counters and put them in Fukushima, hopefully in uh, Chusukoka uh, province, <clears throat> in uh, Australia, Hawaii, LA, Tucson, Omaha, Baltimore, and Ireland. So if you kind of set your map, you'll see like a string of beads roughly spaced all the way from Fukushima all the way to Ireland. And put the same value counter the same thing, testing the water, the vegetables, the air, and the rainwater, and then post those regularly, bi-weekly, to get a citizen's radiation watch. And that will be a fundraiser that will be starting, because you know, there is simply no money anywhere to do anything. Um, and so we'll actually get the help of the Home Center, or Reverence Efforts, and others uh, look to do a fundraiser. Uh, we estimate it would cost under 10000 to set up a worldwide citizens' radiation watch. And so that's one of the very next projects that we'll be doing. And part of the taping and trying to get publicity and get critically interested people involved will be to present that to help us implement it and get a measure of what's happening. Pat's question is well posed, so no, a vast amount of the science has not even yet been uncovered on how to solve any of the problems. Other questions? Simplyinfo.com. It's it's that's where there's we've been sending all the information to them. 
and they have these experts. But I just want to say, so you don't even need, you don't even need, you have a maintenance building right now that's sinking. They have sinkholes over there, they have geologic features that are underneath the reef, which they don't know if it's a cavern, they don't know if it's a, a pile of rubble, they don't know what it is. The geologic report from 68 said they found topsoil down in there. So obviously soil and cracks. And, and we also have um, uh, some other features which aren't uh, the geological point blank on it. And it's unique to our area where you have these sinkholes, you have these geologic holes in the bedrock. So the bedrock itself may not be stable, what they're actually putting in the nickel power plant. Fort Calhoun is basically sitting on four steel beams connected to the bedrock. And just ask yourself a question, would you build a nuclear power plant on four stills? Because that's all they've done, because all the soil underneath it is sandy soil from the riverbed. Right. So when it flooded, all of, the ge all of that soil was changed. It's just filled up with water, moved it all around, and then when the water went back down, it changed. Yes, you need to call your OPPD board directors and you need to tell them that you would like to have them shut down in a good power plant. Because once they shut it down, then we can go into a cold storage option where they begin to seal the rods uh, into the concrete bolts um, and that's a very interesting process. You know, and, um, and start the product, and then you'll be able to cement the whole damn thing over. But the federal government hopefully will come up with a, a storage site at some point, and then that stuff will can be moved off site, which I'm not sure I even want them to do. I'm not sure I want radioactive waste moving around on trains and trucks and boats and all the other ways that they'd like to move it to a site. So, you know, that's not a good option either. So, I just want to point out that this whole nuclear option has just been horrible from day one. And we just need to stop doing it. And renewable energy is so simple, it's ridiculous. We have enough electrons hitting the surface of the planet to power everything. All we have to do is build the infrastructure to put those electrons into our wires. And that's all we have to do. And, uh, and as you find out now, Iowa electric bills are going down because of wind energy. You have Facebook going, well, we're going to build in Iowa because they have renewable energy. That was a loss of a billion dollar data set that Omaha could have had if we had renewable energy. So the pursuit of our public utility for dirty fuels is costing jobs, high-tech jobs, billion-dollar investments from young companies that would like to see renewable energy on their path. So I just want to point that out. And most of the board members have been there for 25 years and 18 years. I do want to give you just a wonderful thing that's happened recently. <coughs> Since we started, I, in 2008, I realized that these guys haven't been challenged. No one even knows who your board members are. No one even knows who they are when you vote for them. So I ran in 2008, Renewable Energy and Efficiency. I got 25,000 votes. I had no money, I went to a few meetings, passed out my stuff. You know, I don't have signs, I don't have 25,000 votes. That was 25% of the voting public who agrees with my ideas. So that's huge, number one. So then in 2010, I ran again. But because I did that, a real politician showed up. So he had seven people on this last ballot. And guess who lost? The board of directors, we lost the election. Tom Barrett is now in there, took his position. We had a death on the board, we got a new guy that the governor appointed, and then um, the um, Blair elected a uranium salesman for their representative. So I just want to point that out, that now the board has uranium lobbyists uh, on it. And I just want to point out that Changing the board members and changing the manager is the only way we can change the way they think. And we got rid of two board managers for lying to me on video. We was able to present that. So the, the, the president of the, uh, the plant manager is no longer with us. The vice president of nuclear is no longer with us. Or they've gone somewhere else. So change can happen. All I did was take a video camera, record these meetings, put it on the web. I had 9,000 hours of viewing these videos, with only 2,000 views. So the people who are watching these videos are really watching them. And people are getting fired, and people are losing elections. You know, and I just want to point that out. Participation is the only way. You gotta go in, and you gotta tell them what you think, and to hell with anything and everybody and your reputations or whatever you think you're trying to protect. Because the bottom line is, we are a dirty fuel utility. We burn coal, we 
us. They don't believe it's toxic. We, use, we generate nuclear waste, which they don't seem to think is very toxic. They have never pursued efficiency, and they've never pursued renewables, ever. And Right now, what we want to do is, <coughs> will the, ourselves, hopefully, will still be able to stay here and visit with you, uh, my wonderful dear wife, Deirdre, has facilitated uh, some refreshments, red cheeses, and fresh fruit, and nuts, and tea, and water, etc. <coughs> and Deirdre herself has been instrumental in the uh, uh, opposition to the Keystone Pipeline. So, you know, here in the office is this little hotbed of uh, <laughs> people back to back working, working the fences, as it were. <coughs> and uh, uh, while we all have a little, uh, maybe, I think we've got some tea and coffee, uh, tea rather than water. And, uh, <coughs> and don't forget, uh, took a great deal of effort to condense all of that material. It's very tight, but it's all there. So be sure to take a handout on that table where Deirdre is walking, even as we speak. <clears throat> and uh, I, I left some business cards in case anyone wants to email me, have another question or follow up, or you're ordering such and such, and you get confused. There's a lot of stuff out there. It is easy to get confused. The only reason we package this was be people saying, you know, I throw my hands up, just get it done. And, and we're happy to do that. We actually, there's no postage either. We pay the postage uh, since TRI's mission is to get stuff out and, and to make something happen. And so let me I'll summarize the formal part of the seminar, and, and then we'll all take a little break and still visit and chat with you. And I think there is really a documentable problem without question. It is affecting us measurably. The effect will be multiplied sooner than we fear by all brilliant and every expert testimony that there is. There are things you can be doing. You want to look that over. You want to start a plan for yourself. The heirs and I, the family, we take that peck to cure. Uh, we're taking a teaspoon of the uh, Indian support water, etc. cetera. Um, we're doing those things ourselves because you can do things for yourself without a lot of cost and still t uh, get protection. <coughs> and I think we'll see more uh, than we may have yet. I'm hoping another follow-up seminar to bring more attention to this problem. Let me thank you all for venturing out and look forward to talking with you on the line.